what I wanted to do today is a really cool message that I pray encourages you, and it's certainly something to, to provoke your thinking, uh, because we really work hard, <coughs> we work hard in this church on making sure that the messages are inspiring and challenging and something to provoke your thinking. Today, I'm going to talk about the world's naughtiest priest. The world's naughtiest priest. Now, just to give a bit of background here, we have been sharing here at church about fear and the role that fear plays in our lives. And if we stop and think about it, actually fear is a big player in our life. Because when you fear something, it holds you back from living life to the full. It prevents you getting involved in relationships or building relationships. It can sabotage relationships. It can also bring you an enormous amount of stress, anxiety. It can bring depression into your life. It can almost make you just not want to wake up and get out of bed. Fear has that much power. And so we have been sharing on this theme, and as we've been sharing on it, a lot of you have been sharing to me on how this theme affects you, and there's so many different aspects to how fear affects us. But we have that verse up there which says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so the two simple steps that we're proposing here in life, if you want to overcome fear in your life, firstly, you need to find out what it is you're fearful of. You need to identify the fear in your life. So is it fear of rejection? Is it fear of failure? Is it fear of death? Is it fear of pain? Is it fear of new circumstances? Whatever it is, identify that fear and then use this verse, use this scripture and put it into, the, into that situation that you're in. Speak it into the situation you confront and you tell that fear that God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, what I wanted to do today is ask a question which is kind of a little bit like looking in the mirror, sometimes a little bit uncomfortable for us as Christians, to actually stop and say, what are the fears that exist in religion? Or more specifically, as we are Christians that uh, follow the Bible, we don't speak of our faith so much as a religion where you follow certain um, rules. We speak of faith as a relationship with Jesus. So it's not really accurate to think of it as a religion. But um, in the fact that, that as Christians we're in relationship with God, what role does fear sometimes play, particularly in the institution of the church? What is the role that sometimes you see fear playing a role in the church? And in order to understand this topic, I wanted to tell you about the world's naughtiest priest. Okay? And I have a picture of him because his name is Johann. His name is Johann Tetzel. And he lived about 500 years ago. And he is, I think, the naughtiest priest in history. So he was a church leader, and let's just say, by naughty, I mean, maybe you went to school and there was that kid up the back who would make the paper airplanes, and when the teacher wasn't looking, he'd just find a victim and go, and hit the victim in the head with the paper, paper plane, uh, and that kid would get in trouble when that kid said, hey, hey, you did that, and the teacher would say, silence. Well, the naughty boy that threw the paper airplanes that is what I'm talking about when I say naughty. He's probably the kid that was stealing from people's lunch boxes, you know? Well, this, in this case, we're talking about the naughty boy, Johann. Now, Johann, in order to understand how naughty he was, we need to understand a little bit about the times in which he lived, because he was, like, that's 500 years ago. At that time, the church was actually the most powerful institution in society, in, in, um, in Germany and in Europe where he lived, um, it was the most powerful institution. And not only was the church powerful, but the Pope, who was like the, the CEO of the church, was incredibly powerful. And what the church was structured a little bit differently at that time, there was a class of people who served the Pope and served the church who were called priests. And the priests were incredibly powerful. 
And many people feared the priest because the priest, the group of people who were priests were men who were set apart from everyone else who were able to uh, know the will of God. And if you go back 500 years ago, there was not a Bible that everyone could read. And in fact, not everyone could read anyway. So in order to find out about God, and that also meant finding out about heaven and hell and sin and what, what I do in life, what I'm allowed to do, and what's okay with God, in order to know the will of God, you had to go to a priest because the priest could understand the Bible. It was written in Latin, and that's what priests learned. So the priest was incredibly powerful because he spoke the words of, or spoke the will of God to, to ordinary people. Um, he was also powerful in that he was the only person, kind of like Eric, who was able to give out the communion bread. So Eric was kind of like our priest type. But imagine that if only Eric could do that, and we had to go to Eric every week and say, Eric, please, can I have the communion bread? Well, that's what the priest did. So Johan, being the naughty boy that he was, he took, to, took a look at this and said, I think that's the gig I'd like, to be a priest. So he decided to become a priest. And the thing about Johan was he was an incredibly smart and a, an incredibly... Uh, persuasive person. He could talk his way into anything, and he used that to become a really popular priest, particularly popular with the headquarters of the church, because what he decided to do was to raise money for the Pope. Uh, of course, he would be taking his little bit on the side. Don't worry about that, because he's a naughty boy. And so what he came up with was this idea that, okay, if priests know the will of God, priests can tell everybody what's okay to do. If you sin and you want your sin forgiven, the priest can forgive your sin. So Johan thought, well, I'm going to take this a little bit further. And I'm actually going to sell forgiveness of sin. So if someone does something naughty, they can come to me, pay me some money, and I'll write them a letter on behalf of the Pope, and they'll have their sins forgiven. This was a, this was a great idea that he came up with. Uh, even more than that, he, de he decided that if people had someone who had died, so maybe you had a, a mother or a father or a relative who'd passed away, and they had done something naughty that was actually keeping them out of heaven, he decided he would sell you the chance to get your relatives out of purgatory and get them into heaven. And this is actually the quote, his marketing pitch. It's up there on the board, what he actually said. He said, and this rhymes, so he's a bit of a rapper before his time. Um, he said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So the idea was, as soon as you put the coin in the box, then he's going to give you a letter and the soul who's in purgatory, and purgatory is kind of like a temporary hell, and they're burning and they want to go to heaven, but they have to pay off their sins. Um, as soon as the money hits the bottom, that soul flies off to heaven. And he would say, that's your dear departed grandmother. You just pay up and you can do that. So that's what he said. Now, I have... A picture of, you know, I was thinking, how did he get away with this? Now, obviously, the powers that be, the authorities in the church, loved this guy because he was raking in the money. People were paying up all over the place. But to understand why he was so successful, we need to understand the role that fear plays, even in Christianity and in religion. Because he didn't just show up on Sunday from another church like I did today. He, he actually made a giant, massive show of the fact that God was coming to town to speak to you and tell you how to get your relatives out of purgatory. And here's a picture. Someone's drawn the picture. And I think I have a, a quote here from the history books about just how he, how he would set the scene. He was really smart. This was like a big, full-on show, a full-on production. So the history books um, by Frederick Myconius... He records it like this. He said that when Tetzel was welcomed to town, the papal bull was carried on velvet or gold cloth. So at the front, there'd be the sign that the Pope's messenger has come. 
Now, he was actually traveling. The Pope actually sent him to travel around to all the villages. And often in the villages where people, um, they couldn't read, and they would see that, wow, the Pope is sending someone to my town? Oh, we better go and see that. And so he would display the emblems of the Pope. And it, it says that all the priests, the monks, councilmen, teachers, pupils, men, women, maids, and children went out to meet him singing in solemn procession with flags and candles. The bells tolled, and when he entered the church, the organ played. A red cross was put up in the middle of the church to which the Pope's banner was affixed. In short, this is what it says, even God himself could not have been welcomed and received more beautifully. So you can see how he sets the scene and there's a guy banging the drums and all the people would come and they want to hear, oh wow, we can't talk to God ourselves so we have to find out from the priest about God and the Pope's messenger is coming to town. So everyone ran out there. Now I also have a, a drawing of his, um, some artwork of him when he would preach because he was an incredible speaker. He was just amazing. And I have a copy of one of his sermons. Because I was thinking, now what did he say that really motivated people to just pour the money in? And as you listen to this, you'll see the role that fear can play. He said this. I don't know if I should read this as a TV evangelist, should I? I don't know. He said, don't you hear? This is what he said. Don't you hear the voices of your wailing dead parents and others who say, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me, because we are in severe punishment and pain. From this, from this pain, you could redeem us with just a small coin, just a small arms, and yet you don't want to do it. Open your ears. The father calls out to his son, open your ears. The mother calls out to her daughter. We have created you, we have fed you, we've cared for you, and we've left you our temporal goods. Why then are you so cruel and harsh that you don't want to save us, even though it only takes a few coins? Oh, you let us lie in flames so that we could slowly go to the promised glory. Yet you could now release us and send us. You could send us to heaven as soon as the coin in the coffer rings. The soul from purgatory springs. That was his message. Not bad, hey? You like me to preach more like that, maybe? So there we have the picture. And people, they just love this. They, they gave him so much money. And the Pope was really happy to build his new St. Uh, Peter's uh, church with the money. And it was just money rolling in. And he's just loving it. Johann Tetzel has made it. Except that some people started to question this and say, hold on, is this really what God is like? Is he really a God of fear that wants us to give over our money? One of the people that didn't like him was a rich man. And the rich man went up to him. And the rich man said, Johan, I know that you can get my relatives out of purgatory. And I know if I've done something wrong, I can pay you money and get forgiveness. But I've got a question for you, Johan. Can you get me forgiveness for some sin that I haven't done yet? Now, what do you think Johan, the naughty, naughtiest priest in the world, thought? He said, sure, of course, but there's a few conditions because this is, a, this is quite rare. The first condition is you have to pay me twice as much money as I've ever had. And the second condition, and I'll think about getting this sorted for you if you do that. The second condition is you have to pay me right now. You can't wait or I'm leaving town. And so the rich man, being rich, says, all right, I'm going to pay for this opportunity to go away and sin and be forgiven. So he pays over the money to Johann Tetzel. And then Johann Tetzel puts the money in his bag. And you know, he's leaving. He's leaving to go back home with his, with his bag of Lots and lots of money. Don't know how much of that was going to go to the Pope. And what happens is the rich man actually goes and hides in the bushes. And sure enough, as Johannes is just waltzing away, all of a sudden the rich man jumps out and says, Hey, I want my money back! And goes, boom, and gives a black eye to Johann. Grab, the rich man grabs the money and runs off. 
And you know, and Tetzel's like, what? What? That's outrageous. You can't do that to the Pope's messenger. So then Johann says, right, police, go get him. And there was a court case. And in the court case, the judge was a bit amused by this, and the people were all watching what's going to happen. But when it came for the rich man to get up and explain what had happened, the rich man pulled out the letter that was the forgiveness of sins and said, actually, the sin I was going to commit was that. And Johann Tetzel said that I was forgiven for it, so therefore I can't be punished. And very interesting, the, the, the judge said, oh, I think he's right here. And from that time on, Johann Tetzel was a little less popular because people started to think about this. Now, Johann Tetzel, there's his, this picture. The reason I'm sharing about him and why he's the naughtiest priest ever is we actually probably would never know about him except that something happened because of him. And there was another priest. And the other priest, I've got a painting of him. Now, I don't know if you can tell me who this next one is. Who knows who that is? That is Martin Luther. So Martin Luther said, hold on a minute here, people. And you've got to remember, the church was incredibly powerful, and it was very risky to speak against people in power who are getting cutbacks or getting, getting uh, money on the side from what, what was happening at the time. But Martin Luther said, no, 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 no. This is not right. I'm going to do something about it. Now, because he did that, the whole world was thrown completely upside down. And what I want to do today is just share three of the things that Martin Luther said, because I think they speak very clearly to us on the issue of fear in religion, and more specifically, fear within the Christian church or fear within the institution of the church. Um, and in saying this, like Luther, I can say that I love the church, and we, as God's people, love the church. And Martin Luther was not afraid to say that, but he was also not afraid to speak out and identify the fears and then uh, expose the fears that are not from God. Because remember, fear doesn't come from the Spirit of God. Power comes from the Spirit of God. Love comes from the Spirit of God and a sound mind. So there are three things, and I, I just want these three things to to protect you and bless you in your Christian walk, wherever you are at in finding faith with Jesus, because they're really important. And they're, they're things that are part of us as Christians today, even though it's 500 years later. Let me tell you what Luther did. I've got a picture there of what he actually did. He was so upset with what he saw um, Johann doing that he went and he pinned his objections to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church. So he basically went downtown in front of everyone and said, all right, these are the problems with what is happening in the church at the moment and how fear is being used to control people and is actually being used for very evil motives. Um, he pins up on the door of the church 95 problems he has. And it's very interesting to note the date because it is exactly 500 years ago, and on October the 31st, from that moment when he puts those the 95 theses, as he puts them onto the door there, suddenly the whole of Europe goes crazy because people start to think, do we really need to live under fear of whether it's a class of people who are more spiritual than us, or an institution that tells us how to think, or that makes the rules? Um, he did that, and it just threw the whole world upside down, and there are so many implications from that today. But let's just identify and categorize some of those objections in three ways. The first thing that Luther said, and it's really important to understand this when you want to talk about fear in the church. The first thing that he proposed is there is not a class of Christians. There, are, there is not a class of Christians, whether it's a single person who speaks on behalf of God or whether it's a group of men um, who speak on behalf of God and tell everyone else what God thinks. He, he rejected the idea of a specific class of priests, and he said, actually, you read the Bible, you study the New Testament, you realize that actually we are all priests. 
the priesthood of all believers was a fundamental thing that Luther said. And as you look at this scripture in 1 Peter 2, you can see the idea coming forward where um, the apostle writes and says, you are not like that for you, and speaking to the whole church, you are a chosen people, you are royal priests. So in other words, everyone that accepts Jesus is, has the same authority and the same power as the class of priest, because you are, in fact, a priest. And I think it's really important to think about that for a moment, because that means that we do not outsource our Christian faith to some person. We do not outsource it to a pastor or a prophet or a priest or a pope. If you look at the Bible, it talks about how Jesus is our one priest, the high priest. We go to Jesus. Anyone can go to Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, young or old. You can go to Jesus. You have the same access as anyone else. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, you remember that Peter spoke about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It was not on a specific class of men. It was upon all flesh. And all who received him, even as Peter was wrapping up on the day of Pentecost, as the church is being launched, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, and you shall receive forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So if you have the Holy Spirit and I have the Holy Spirit, we don't need to outsource understanding the will of God to another human because, after all, they are just mere men. And Johann Tetzel was showing the fact that some of these people who outsour we were outsourcing power to were actually corrupt. They were actually taking money for themselves, making up rules, saying things about God that just came into their head. So the first thing to realize in your Christian faith is you have access to God through Jesus Christ and not through another person. It's tempting sometimes, obviously, if you, go, if you become a Christian through your parents, then obviously you go to your parents, but you cannot have your parents standing in the place of God. You don't have your parents' religion. Or if a pastor brings you to, to Christ or a teacher that you really like on YouTube is like blessing your life, that's good, but they do not, you do not outsource to them um, the right to determine your spiritual destiny. You have the ability to pray and come before God. That's why we don't, have, we don't need people to tell us um, how, how decisions we should make. Sometimes you see religious fear being used to tell people who they should marry, how they should dress, what job they should have, how they should vote, all these kinds of things. You don't have to listen to a church committee. You don't have to listen to a, a pastor or someone in a special class because, as Luther declared, the priesthood of all believers. It's a very important thing that is an antidote for fearing other people who use religion. Now, the second thing he said is he said that we are saved by grace. Johann Tetzel was running around telling people what they need to do to get God's salvation and forgiveness, but in actual fact, salvation is the free gift of God it is not something we do by works. It's not something you get a system, okay, if I do this and I do that, then I'll get salvation. Sola gratia is what he said. The, in Latin, the word sola means only grace. And it means it's only grace that saves us. You find this throughout the New Testament. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It's not because you've got a lot of money and you gave it to the church, or it's not because you do certain things that make you a good person. I think the next verse in Ephesians actually says, this is so you can never boast. You can never say, hey, well, I gave all that money to build that church in Rome. No, you're not saved by that. Um, sola fide is um, by faith alone. So another thing that Luther said tied into the same idea is that we are justified. We are made right in the eyes of God, not because of something we do, not because we've paid money, but because of faith. It's faith that justifies us before God. So faith alone and grace alone is what saves us. A very important 
principle, and you'll see it in your own life when you sometimes hear that fearful voice that says, maybe God is not going to accept me, or maybe I'm not good enough to follow Jesus. Maybe I'm not good enough to be, to call myself a Christian. Well, just remember, we are not saved by how good we are. We are saved by grace. We are saved. It's our faith in Jesus that saves us, not the works that we do. So salvation by grace, Martin Luther declared that, and it threw the whole church into chaos because people started to say, oh, wait a minute. Maybe he's talking something good here. Now, the third thing, the third idea that he introduced is the supremacy of the Bible. Again, the the Latin word sola scriptura, sola being only scripture. And by this, what he meant is, Okay, if someone in religion is telling you that you should do this, you get your relatives out of purgatory, they need to submit to the Bible. They need to have some reference point for that. And if it's not in the Bible, and if you can't justify it from the Bible, then it has to be rejected because it's just a man-made idea. So even today, many ideas are thrown around about God, but what Martin Luther was really saying is the only ones that count are the ones that have reference to the supremacy of the Bible. In the New Testament, we are told in uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 that the Scriptures, the Bible, the Scripture is breathed from God. It's the words of God. It's God-breathed, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God Anyone who wants to follow God may be, and there's the word, thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, that's all you need. If you have the Bible, you have all you need in terms of working out your faith. It's the supremacy of Scripture. So those three important statements, I think on the next slide, we've got them there. They're really helpful for you and for me in our own Christian walk, because from time to time, we can be tempted to lose our way. We might hear ideas that we're not sure where they come from and should we follow them. But if we go back to these same things that Luther said, you can see that it's a powerful antidote to fear itself. Um, The priesthood of all believers, that's the idea that wherever you are in life, you have access to the Holy Spirit. You have access to God. You can come before, through Jesus Um, as your only priest, Jesus, you can come to him. He's the one mediator that we have, as the scripture tells us. Um, Salvation by grace, the fact that we don't have to work our way to heaven or do things to fit within a religious structure or religious um, rules about, about what we should do, because we're saved by grace, and it's God who saves us. We're justified by faith. That's the sola gratia and the sola fede. Um, And the third one, the supremacy of the Bible, that we have the Bible. Martin Luther felt so strongly about this that he pretty much blew up the church by doing a very simple thing. He actually translated the Bible from its original, instead of being into Latin, which was the language that the priests like Johann Tetzel could uh, share and tell what it meant, He actually completely blew up the whole thing by translating it into ordinary language in German so that the people in his country could read it for themselves and go, hold on a minute, What's what's this stuff about this? I don't see that in the Bible. And so the supremacy of the Bible is a gift that we all have now. You can get the phone Bible. You can get the Bible in our church app. You can get it you know, on the internet. You can buy copies of it in all kinds of languages, all different versions. So We have that, and that's a gift that we've had. I think it's really interesting when you think about these three principles to even see them in this Scripture that we're writing on our hearts and memorizing. The Scripture says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. If you are a priest, and I am a priest, a royal priesthood, we have tremendous power because we have access to God through Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. That brings us power. Salvation by grace is about the fact that we have love, isn't it? Grace is actually the agape love of the good, good Father, that the Father actually loves us and receives us, and we are saved by grace, not through what we do. 
That's the love. And the supremacy of the Bible is the whole thing about wisdom and having a sound mind. So you can see in that scripture, those three things that Luther taught and those thing, three things that completely changed the whole world that we live in as we know um, are contained in that scripture. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. It's not the class of people that have the power. Actually, the power is the Holy Spirit within you. And of love, the love. And let's never forget that it's grace that saves us, and it's grace that we bring to the world. We don't bring a sword. We bring love. And also the Scripture, that the Scripture brings us a sound mind. The Bible is there just to guide and, and correct, as that Scripture said in, in 2 Timothy 3.16. It's there. It's there for teaching and correcting, and it's there to like light your path. Thy word is a light for my, my path, and a, a lamp for my feet, and a light for my path. Um, that's what the Bible brings us.